Good morning to everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here with you all. First of all, on behalf of ABM and the Aeromaking Commission, we'd like to thank you everyone for attending this webinar, Current Technologies to Control Blast Furnace Flexible Operation. Uh, this webinar was organized by ABM, Sao Paulo Regional and the Aeromaking Commission. Our event will feature three lectures by renowned companies, Daniele, Holwood and Primetals to which we thank in advance for the kind of cooperation. Now we'd like to explain a change in the coordination of the event. Mr. Eric Torres, current CEO of ArcelorMittal, was scheduled to participate initially, but another important commitment did not allow him to be with us. That way, we will now have the satisfaction of counting of the coordination of the QLEG from ArcelorMittal Tubarão, Mr. Douglas Rui, from whom we now read a brief curriculum. Uh, Douglas Rui was born in November 4, 1974, in Vitoria Street, Santo Brasil. Douglas Rui is Energy and Aeromaking General Manager at ArcelorMittal Latin Brasil Flat Steels. He has a degree in electrical engineering from Espiritu Santo Federal University, also specialized in reliable engineering as well in metallurgical engineering, Espiritu Santo Technological Institute. He holds an MBA in business management from Fundação Getúlio Vargas. He has participated in many management training courses such as leadership development explored by Salomitao University in Luxembourg in 2012 and others from different institutions like uh, Fundação Dom Cabral. Mr. Douglas started his career at ArcelorMittal Tubarão, former CST, as a trainee engineer in 1997. In 2003, he was promoted to Blast Furnace Area Maintenance Manager. 2012, he took the position of the Blast Furnace Plant Manager, responsible for maintenance and operations. Douglas also has experience in the center plant management. 2019, he was promoted to energy and aero making general manager responsible for the Cohen or Yards Coke Center Blast Furnace Energy Operations. Through his career over 23 years, Douglas has had the opportunity of taking part of coordination in many relevant events like Blast Furnace Reliance, Chilled Heart, recoveries, blowdowns, blow-ins in blast furnace, high performance projects, such as a lower fuel consumption and reliable projects. He has a huge experience on safety and environmental management. We are in good hands in the coordination. So now we'd like to wish to all speakers and participants a great and profitable event. And now we give uh, the floor to Mr. Douglas to coordinate the event section. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to start our webinar by welcoming our speakers and all of you that are here today, the iron making community, but also the steel making community. Thank you a lot for your presence. I hope that you and your families are doing well. Also, I'd like to reinforce the cares regarding COVID-19. Let's be safe. This event will be held in English, but you can trigger the caption of Microsoft Teams. For that, it's necessary to, to enter through the Teams app. It won't work through the browser, okay? Click on the gear icon in the lower right corner and enable the caption. During the presentation, feel free to send your questions via chat in English or Portuguese, since we will have 30 minutes at the end to debate. Also, at the end of the event, we will send you a satisfaction survey. We would like to hear your opinions and suggestions so that we can improve our services and products. This webinar will be recorded and it will be available on ABM TV for that subscribe to our channel to have access. 
Bom dia a todos. Inicialmente, eu gostaria de agradecer a presença de todos, dos nossos apresentadores, da comunidade dos Altos Fornos, mas também a comunidade da Cearia. Esse evento, espero que tudo esteja bem com vocês e com suas famílias. Gostaria de deixar um reforço com relação aos cuidados referentes ao Covid-19. Vamos seguir todos os protocolos. Esse evento será conduzido em inglês, mas é possível ativar as legendas através do Microsoft Teams app. Para isso, clique no canto inferior direito, naquele símbolo que tem uma engrenagem, e ative as legendas. Durante as apresentações, as perguntas podem ser feitas via o chat. Podem ser feitas tanto em português quanto em inglês, e ao final nós faremos um debate de 30 minutos com os nossos palestrantes. Também ao final da apresentação, será encaminhada uma pesquisa de satisfação. Gostaríamos muito de ouvir a opinião de vocês, sugestões, para que possamos melhorar os nossos produtos e serviços. Destaco também que esse webinar está sendo gravado e estará disponibilizado na ABM TV. Para tanto, basta acessar o canal e inscrever-se. We appreciate everyone's presence. Let's start the webinar. Current technology to control blast furnace flexible operation. Our first speaker is Mr. Rob Van Opbergen from Daniele Corus with the presentation Modern Blast Furnace Iron Making Technology and Know How Supporting Stable Sustainable Operations Under All Circumstances. Mr. Rob Van Opbergen has been working in blast furnace iron making since the 80s, starting at the iron making operations at the Eichmilden Steel Plant, then owned by Hugovans, currently operated by Tata Steel Europe, where fortunately I had the opportunity of being some years ago, a very good, very good plant. For the last five years, Rob Van Opbergen has been manager of the blast furnace operational assistance department at Daniele Corus. In this role, he has supported the steel producers on all continents in stabilizing and optimizing their iron making operations. Projects have included Chilled Hearth Recovered, which is the nightmare of the blast furnace community, coke rate reduction, co-injection optimization, and overall process stabilization. Mr. Rob, thank you for your presence. It's with you. Okay, it should be working now, I guess. Can you see my screen? Yes, it's yes, okay. Yes, it's okay. It's okay. Okay. Good morning, uh, all. Good morning. I also learned that some people from Europe and Asia are uh, joining us. Uh, <clears throat> so, good evening and good afternoon also for you. Uh, yeah, the introduction by... Um, it's, it's, it's done um, quite well uh, till now. Um, yeah, I, I am. Uh, we are invited to tell something about our technologies, how to work with uh, flexible operations, and uh, to counterpart uh, every circumstances. Well, first of all, I would like you to introduce um, the company Daniel Corus. Possibly uh, a lot of you already know the background. We are uh, uh, in, in the part of the iron and steel making focused on iron making, steel making, energy and, and environment. And we are a full daughter of Daniele, who also supplies the rest of the steel plant. Our history a little bit. Uh, we started somewhere in the 70s in the iron making, then started steel making and later environmental parts first known as Hogovens Technical Services, HTS, later as Daniele Corus, which is still our brand name. And since uh, not long ago, we are also doing uh, uh, the steel plant, the converter section uh, from Heimaud and uh, Daniele Corus. Okay, we are located in, in Europe, in the Netherlands, very close to uh, Heimaud or in Amman, you can see that, and very close to the steel plant. 
currently, if I look outside, I can see the two blast furnaces well in operation and the headquarters of uh, Tata Steel. Okay, we are requested to, to, to uh, show our technologies about uh, flexible operation. And then you come to the definition, what is flexible operation? What does it count for? Well, it's the ability of the process to accommodate um, irregularities in certain parameters and sure without uh, resulting in process anomalies. Well, <coughs> if you are in blast furnace departments, you surely know that irregularities are always there. You cannot avoid it. So what kind of irregularities are there? Raw materials. Uh, due to prices, due to circumstances, your raw materials have to, to change in chemical or in physical uh, uh, properties. Uh, you can have uh, uh, demand uh, spikes or dips caused by downstream or upstream problems in, in the plant. Uh, you have to counteract on climate. Uh, for instance, if you talk about uh, the North American plants, which have uh, win winter time and frozen lakes, uh, cannot be supplied during winter, so a lot of stock. And if you look to Asia, you're talking about uh, monsoon issues, which certainly influences uh, the blast furnace uh, process. Yeah, one step further is um, equipment failure. We don't like that. Of course, we do all our preventive maintenance very well. We maintain our stuff, but the reality is that there is always equipment failure. And there are other things that needs flexibility, like we have encountered this year, the COVID pandemic, which not only uh, caused problems in demand, but also in how to operate the plants. Okay, what is um, the significance? If you look at uh, regular irregularities, these are the normal, uh, the normal changes you have in a plant, small changes in the chemical and physical properties of, of the, the raw materials, uh, small problems um, in, in the cast house. But that can be uh, normally that can be uh, easy covered. If you go to the next step to a switch of operating scenario, <coughs> you have to make uh, a decision to modify your process set points quite, 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 quite much, substantially, and that's that's a step further. Then you come to the serious irregularities, the really problem making irregularities, which everybody encounters, scabs in the furnace, hanging furnace, slipping, equipment failure. Uh, you can think about all these kind of things where you have to work on and you have to be flexible to counteract on these kind of problems. So then the question comes, how to, how to accommodate these um, irregularities? Which technologies and tools are available? I've tried to put that in, in, in some kind of table where, um, where you see the, the, the four major, uh, the five major things. Uh, the normal operation where you have regular small changes, you have the, the fluctuation making a step further, a scenario switch totally different uh, operating parameters, upsets, and even a chill, which fortunately doesn't happen so much anymore, but I can assure you we have regular few times a year the question to support plants in chill recovery. What kind of technologies are, <coughs> are available in the, in, the, in the industry to support us as an operator? Well, we have the expert systems. We have the process instrumentation, which is increasing over the years, more and more and more, more sophisticated, creating more and more data getting into operators' minds. Of course, we have the procedures and the organization. And for sure, we have all experienced and trained operator. So how to put that in, in some kind uh, of expect? 
how to accommodate this in the required flexibility. If you look at, at the normal operation, you have the top, the top level expert system, which is capable to run the furnace in an efficient way. For that, instrumentation is vital. Without instrumentation, expert systems cannot work. Of course, this, uh, that's a difficult one for me uh, to define whether it is supportive or vital, but process inter instrumentation can be very uh, rudimental up to very uh, sophisticated. But anyway, uh, you need at least the, the, the full process instrumentation to get an expert system working correctly. Uh, the procedures and organization in normal operation has to be incorporated in the expert system. You have to program that, uh, how to deal with silicon or hot, ma hot metal uh, quality changes, how to deal with raw material quality changes uh, and, and, and the process changes. So you have to program that into the expert system. Then you have the experienced operator. Well, if uh, the expert system is working fairly well, they get lazy, they can lean behind. They only have to look at the process and it's correcting themselves. And if you look at external support, it's not needed at all. If you come to fluctuation, the expert system is still able to, um, to accommodate that. And also the process is still supported to that. Also in this kind of cases, you need to put all your procedures into the expert system. And the experienced operator is supportive to look, to really look if everything's going well, what the expert system, in, in this case, uh, if you talk about closed loop systems, he has to evaluate if the actions are correct. External support is not necessary. But then you come to the next step in the scenario switch. If you go to totally different uh, raw materials or uh, different operation uh, levels, very low uh, productivity, then your expert system is not fully capable to control it anymore because you first have to find the stable situation. So it's only supportive. Process instrumentation is still that. But procedures, you have to find uh, the right procedures for the new situation. And you have to define that in the expert system to get it working into normal operation. In this kind of cases, you need an experienced operator. It's vital because the systems do not tell you, the systems do tell you everything, but decision making has to be done by an operator. If you look at external support, depends on the scenario where you are going to, can be very, uh, uh, very added value, but you have to really look at the scenarios. If you go to upsets, with serious upsets, scabs, hanging, slipping, equipment failure, uh, instrumentation failure, you can think of all these kind of things. You only get a late warning for your expert system. That means that the problem is already in the furnace and you have to deal with that. There's no way that you can change it. You have to live what, with what is in the furnace at that moment. Process inter instrumentation, of course, is needed, but procedures are not there. It's, well, we call it the playbook, playbook. The playbook only gives you general advice on how to get the furnace back into a safe situation. But you cannot describe every failure of any equipment of any circumstance in the furnace. Huh? Has everybody, has anybody thought that it is possible to charge a quartzite in a coke, coke bunker? I have seen that happening in the 80s. And I can, I can tell you there is no system, no expert system who can tell you what to do. So there we need a very experienced operator. External support also depends on the upset. And then we come to the latest part, the chill, like um, Louis was telling that the chill is the worst case scenario for blast furnace. And in that case, an expert system is useless. If you come to that situation, you have to deal only with experienced operator. 
and external support, which can give you major added value. And that's because hopefully a chill doesn't occur so much. But on average, I see it happening in every steel plant once in five to ten years time. It's there. So you need to be prepared for that. OK, then we look at, 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 at our technologies. Um, where, which purpose do they serve? Well, if you look at the expert system and the process instrumentation, it's mostly cost optimization. Uh, to make sure that your hot metal quality is, is, uh, is in the right bandwidth and your fuel consumption is in the, in the right bandwidth. And these systems, they were built because, well, <laughs> you, you know, uh, an operator on one shift knows it better than the other shift, so they start turning on all the knobs they can find. And an expert system can help you to, uh, to put that through procedures in, in the operation. But cost optimization, if you talk about cost optimization of about 10 kg of coke per year per, uh, per ton hot metal, and you talk about a, a blast furnace of uh, 10,000 tons a day, then you talk about savings of 7 million a year, which is quite a lot of money. But you also have to look at the right bottom of the screen where the major risks are, a chill, due to scenario switches uh, or uh, uh, yeah, scenario switches or major upsets. These costs are huge. If you talk on an, an average recovery on an average chill uh, before you can start the recovery, before you are aware of what's going on, before you can restart and be back in normal operation, it takes around three weeks. And that's for a 10,000, uh, a 10,000, on a day furnace, you talk about 21 million euros. So the major risk is about three times, the cost of that is about three times as high as what you gain on cost optimization by expert systems. So what I, I want to tell by this is that expert systems, you need them to, to bring the cost optimization, but for sure, do not forget your operators. And that's what we have seen in the past that where people are used to working with closed loop expert system, they lose the feeling, they lose the routine. They, they do not know what to do anymore when you really come to uh, the area in the, in the right bottom. OK, well, I, I already explained that. Uh, the, the margin of hot metal is about 100 euro uh, a ton. Production 2000 to 10,000 ton. At the end, you will lose quite a lot of money, but not only that. You also have a problem with product delivery to customers. You have a risk of losing customers for a longer period. Uh, I've, I've seen furnaces going out of operation because of big upsets for two months. Uh, it can even it can even end, end your company if such things happen. OK, the technologies we, which are available, the expert systems. Why do we need expert systems? In the past, we only had a few measurements in the field where the operator has to uh, rely on. These were low productivity furnaces, short campaigns, but an operator could, uh, could deal with this information. Nowadays, we have a lot of inputs from all our process uh, instrumentation. It's a lot of info, but what do you have to do with that? Well, an expert system will uh, assure that all this data is processed, uh, calculated and uh, shown to the operator in an, in an easy way to take the right action. Also, an advice can come from the Daniele Core system. Um, well, we, we, have, we have chosen for an expert system which is not closed loop because we still believe that uh, if you saw the, the previous slides that an operator is still the most important guy in, in, in controlling the furnace and can counteract on any problem there is. What does our uh, DC system uh, expert system uh, offers? 
very good measurements, visualization, interpretation, good decision support, and that results in cost optimization, in a more stable process, and in an operator advice to make a good decision. But we do not offer closed loop operation because we still think that um, uh, a blast furnace is not yet ready for closed loop. I have been working quite some while for uh, Linde. Linde is um, uh, a technical gases supply company where I've been working in the operations. And these plans were very easy to, um, to bring into a closed loop expert system. Why? Because the raw material is only air and electricity. And that's almost everywhere in the world the same. So it's very easy to automate this. And what we see at blast furnaces is that we do everything in our, uh, in our capacity to, to stabilize raw materials, but there's always a change due to price, due to disturbances. You're never sure what you get and you have to work with that. Okay, we also have some, ex some examples of uh, modern process instrumentation, uh, the top camera, which shows you uh, where the center of the furnace is and what the temperatures are of the, of the surface of the rest of the burden. Three air cameras, which, which can help you to determine what's happening behind the three airs and also can give you a warning if something goes wrong with the PCI. But these are just a few examples. Um, Procedures and organization, the playbook. Nah, the playbook is only for non-standard operating uh, procedures. And you cannot describe it into detail. So it are general guidelines who do not focus on optimization of the process of production, but just to bring back the furnace into a safe condition. And if you have these kind of procedures in place to give responsibility to certain people, authorization, then you can eliminate excess waiting time and internal debate. And what we have seen is that internal debate and not knowing exactly what action to do can result in a chill. So it's very important to have a playbook for non-standard operating uh, moments. And to do that, you have to empower your operational staff to be prepared for these kind of circumstances. External support, uh, we have been doing a lot of uh, external support, like, like, like was said in the introduction. Uh, it's a proven concept. I can assure you that if you, if you put a business case on, uh, on remote support, of, uh, on, on uh, external support, I can assure you that the payback time is only a few weeks, and then you will have all the benefits of that. The amount of savings we have created over the last years is unbelievable high. Uh, if, you, if you bring in external expertise, you have uh, a different angle of looking at problems. Uh, go outside. Sometimes it's only a, a confirmation of things you, you know, but you can't get it through the, the management system. It's also a way that if, if you need more uh, more people or more, yeah, more support in a short time because of big problems. We can bring in a, a big team of uh, external specialists, worldwide external specialists, to uh, support you through the difficult times. And even now, we are um, since since Corona, we are forced to um, to work on remote control and. Um, I have to say that that's very. Uh, in, in the beginning, it was quite difficult, but now we have now we have learned to work with that. It's very good with the modern data and communication tool. We can do it remotely. And even if if our expert system is in place, we can direct access to the process of the plant, and can support you very quickly in in problems which which occur. And recently, only a, a few weeks ago we were able to do a fully remote managed chilled heart recovery. And uh, that was completed uh, within six days. So that was a very good result. 
uh, done uh, through our dedicated, uh, yeah, let's uh, let's say let's call it a, a situation room with all the equipment available. Yeah, this is something I give you some time to read this because this is written 70 years ago. And our experience is that this is still valuable. It's still happening. It's 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 in a lesser extent, but still still around. Okay, then we have some um, some case studies for you, especially around uh, restarting of furnaces in difficult situations. Well, the common reasons are always uh, more or less the same. Uh, Sometimes it's it's a management underestimation. Uh, we want to have maximum production or minimum production as low as possible, going outside the normal operation ranges. Uh, raw material quality change. Uh, you all know the people in, in the purchase department who find uh, somewhere some raw materials for a very cheap price, and it should be the same, but your furnace is not reacting to that. Sometimes you're pushed to postpone maintenance, which causes um, equipment failure. Major change in operation parameters, sometimes logistic problems. Uh, you will see that, that the frequency of chills will, will increase if there is no, if there are not enough process instrumentation or an expert system available. And also the skills the decision making skills of shift operators. Uh, what we have learned is that a chill of a furnace is within eight to 12 hours. So it's only a shift, only a shift away. But normally it's a circumstance of an, an, a combination of several circumstances why a furnace is chilling. This is an example. Uh, in this case, the furnace had an unstable PCI. Uh, due to that, the slag chemistry changed it, which caused the liqu liquidus temperature of the primary slag to, uh, to increase a lot. Not enough energy in the furnace. The slag solidified, connection lost to the two years between the tap hole, and in 10 hours the furnace was lost. And we see these kind of things always around the chill. It's a very quick, quick action. And if you do not take the, the, the right actions within these eight hours, you're lost for three weeks operation. Well, what is the challenge in a, in a, in a recovery? Uh, you have to reduce the time between loss production and, and again to normal supply. To normal supply to the steel plant with the normal uh, hot metal quality. But of course it has to be done safely. And what, 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 where do you have to think about? It's, it's also the organization. You have to cover 24 seven hours uh, work operation, and you have to take into account that it will take two to three weeks. Well, this is a huge, huge burden on, on the existing organization, which is not built for this kind of um, support. So uh, your, your workload is about double. So you have to organize that. You need experienced leader in process and operation 24 seven to look at your process and take the right actions. You need to assure that you have all your emergency services in place, fire brigade, medical, and you all have to organize this in a very short time because this chill is there and you have to bring the firms back. And Next to that, you need special equipment, machinery to clean the cast house and also redundancy because the atmosphere to clean the cast house is, is not easy. Your machinery will also have a risk to, to fail. 
And what the, what's the most important one is lens equipment to create the connection between Tepal and Triers. In the old days where the distance between Tepal and, uh, and Triers was small, smaller than two meters, you had a good chance to create a connection by manual lensing through three years and through the tap hole. But with the big furnaces and distances between tap hole and three years more than four meter or close to four meter, manual lensing has very little success. You also have to take in account all the risks which are there during the recovery. Uh, you can have an explosive gas mixture in your furnace. You can have major slips and a release of hot top gas to the atmosphere. Uh, you have to be prepared for unexpected hot liquid flows, uh, leaking three years, burning out of three years, tap hole or hearth breakout, runner overflows, bad separation of hot metal and slag, liquid splashing during lancing, at least you can end up in a catastrophe where even people get hurt or killed. So you need to know what is necessary during the recovery. And you have to do that very quickly. So first, when you have a chill, you have to create a dedicated task force. Now, this is an example of a runner overflow where there was not enough cast house management causing a lot of damage and even, uh, how do you call that, uh, delay in the recovery of the furnace. Okay, how to prepare yourself for these kind of unexpected high costs and risks? You have to evaluate your own organization for situation readiness. Uh, you have to incorporate the emergency support groups fire brigade, medical aid, safety department, you have to teach them what's happening around recoveries because it will be totally different than your normal operation risks. And you have to, to fill in the missing, the missing gaps by training your personnel or support from external parties. And you have to create a general script playbook with different scenarios to reduce workload when emergency situation occurs. And believe me, the burden to organize this all directly after a chill is huge. Okay, this is uh, a restart of, uh, of a blast furnace <coughs> with 24 three years. This was not a recovery. This was a restart, I think, after a stop of two or three weeks, which was well prepared with lenses. And you can see that we had uh, the furnace back in full operation after 56 hours by using uh, our equipment. Um, the OxyFuel lens, uh, this is special designed equipment. Um, OxyFuel, you can use different uh, types of gases and oxygen. And you can, um, uh, this is a prerequisite for fast secured safe blowing after an unplanned stove. And for sure you need this kind of equipment for a quick recovery of a chilled furnace. Now, we have been um, developing our equipment and our recovery methods. Uh, here you can see the benchmark in hours uh, of recovering furnaces. Every chill recovery special. You need to set out a strategy, how to recover the furnace, analyze what's going on, analyze and try to understand what's hap what happened in the furnace and what the situation in the furnace is. But in general, we were able to do that in 14 days. But by improving due to experience, we are able now to say within 10 days after blowing of the furnace, we have a full recovery. And we all did it in one attempt with our Oxyfuel lenses. Okay, then the remote recovery. Well, that was something special to us. Uh, in the past, we also thought this was uh, quite impossible, but the customer asked us to, uh, to support them after they were working uh, one week 
with manual lensing and they couldn't get a good connection to the TEPL. Well, the, the luckily situation was that that customer had purchased our equipment, a full package with the core grills, with the lenses, with everything is needed to do a full recovery. The customer was able to put cameras in the cast house, two year floor and uh, accessible to, to our specialist, continuously process data, remote control and continuous communication. And we were here in the office 24-7 to uh, to support the customer and this was a really fast recovery in 138 hours we were back online with 23 years all 23 years open this is uh, a few of our uh, fully equipped emergency situation room well what is lacking flexibility that's the inability to maintain a stable process when parameters shift outside normal operation margins. Implement an expert system for cost optimization and process stabilization. And to support that system by uh, process instrumentation. But on the other end, there is no replacement for experienced operators. Eliminate the human error by using expert systems but you have to maintain the human factor. Train and practice your operators, introduce mitigation processes, practical risk-based action plans, cascading quick decision-making process. And for sure, rely on external support to import additional expertise and experience, improve safety and reduce workload. And we can support you very quickly within 24 hours after you make a call. Okay, I think this, uh, was the end of my presentation. I think I have a little bit overrunning time. I hope you don't mind too much. Okay, okay Rob, Rob, thank you thank very, you much, very for much for your excellent presentation. presentation. So, we're, so we're, now we're going to have, have the speaker, the speaker Mr. Burns from Google, with the presentation. Whole Wolf technology and service portfolio supporting blast furnace operation with variable production targets, which is a subject totally connected with our current needs, especially in this tough year and considering the challenges that we have ahead. Mr. Philip Burns holds a diploma in metallurgy and materials engineering from the RWTH in Germany. He is leading the Paul Wolf Blast Furnace Process Team based in the headquarters in Luxembourg, where fortunately I also had the opportunity of being some years ago. Oh, we know that Paul Wolf is a strong partner of the steelmaking. Over the past 11 years, he has been providing remote and on-site support and consultancy to customers worldwide regarding environmental, technological and economic aspects of blast furnace operation. Main topics are optimization for productivity increase, production cost optimization, and lifetime increase, as well as planning and on-site assistance for critical BF operations, such as blow-in, blow-down, shield half recovery, and applicability of the new Povur technology. Further tasks include blast furnace and blast furnace plant dimensioning, as well as development of process modeling and automation concepts. So, Philip, thank you for your presence. It's with you. Yeah, and Douglas, uh, I have to thank you for the uh, for the introduction. So, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and um, best regards here from Luxembourg. Today, in the next uh, approximately 30 minutes, uh, we will have an overview of the Paul Word technology and service portfolio that can support blast furnace operation with variable production targets. And of course, in particular, we'll focus in this presentation on the support for such phases um, of um, um, blast furnace slowdowns and reduced production output. So in this presentation, after a short introduction to the current situation 
and the special demands um, that um, are arising from that. Um, we will have a look um, what that means for the furnace uh, in terms of uh, slowdown and stoppage. And in the end of the presentation, we will see which benefits and operation support for stoppage and restart operation can bring. To get us a bit into the topic, um, let's have um, a look on some production data and the outlook that was recently um, published on World Steel. So although in September um, an improvement in Brazil could be seen, um, globally uh, the steel demand, uh, steel demand went in uh, 2020 in a severe reduction and is also not forecasted um, to fully recover in 2021. And this also goes along with our internal um, tracking, which shows among our, uh, our customers numerous uh, stoppages and slowdowns for economic reasons. So when we have on the blast furnace an adaptation for the production rate to be made, the, uh, the possibilities are not endless. Generally, such a reduction can be achieved by either slowing down the operation or bringing the blast furnace operation to a full stoppage. So this is a selection that is at the end not only a technical question, but it is depending on many additional factors, such as an internal risk assessment in the plant, the market conditions and uh, particularly the outlook for the market. Are there any local constraints on the plant? Are there works or particular repair works that could be combined with phases of stoppage? What is the general situation of the plant and the company set up? Um, is a reduction um, considered only at one location? Is the plant in a possibility to stop one or several blast furnace? And in general, what is the situation with the workforce? So these are points that are, of course, to be considered um, by the plant when making a decision, but also points important uh, um, for companies such as Povut as um, service providers for any consultancy. Generally, one can say that the blast furnace is an extremely versatile reactor. That means the blast furnace can handle quite different production conditions in terms of raw material input and also of production targets. Though when it comes to slowing down the production rate, there are some limits. So generally speaking, the blast furnace can be reduced to approximately 75% of its nominal production without any major modifications on the process. So there is um, principally there's everything slowed down a bit. Um, the blast rate is, is, is reduced. Oxygen input and fuel input are also reduced, but in a, on a relative base um, per ton of hot metal, they stay more or less the same. And at the end, the blast furnace is behaving practically the same way as, as in a normal operation. When going further down with production rates, and here um, an approximate target would be 50%, um, we will uh, face some significant changes to the blast furnace process. So it means the hot blast rate is further reduced. Uh, in many plants that would mean an operation with a partially open snort, the oxygen addition is fully stopped as uh, the target is to reduce production rate um, in order to control flame uh, temperature. Steam injection is used, hot blast temperature is decreased. The blast furnace is either on an all coke operation because we need to consume the pre-produced coke or at least it's on a strongly reduced injection rate. So we have resulting changes in the thermal control of the furnace and um, typically such a situation is also combined with a plant-wide impact on the raw material qualities. 
And together with that longer residence time of the materials and their degradation in the blast furnace, it can uh, lead to additional difficulties in the operation of a furnace. So if uh, we have in the following then a short look on the behavior um, of such a blast furnace, I try to list a few of the main problems that can occur in, in such situation. Of course, a blast furnace is always able to surprise us with the unforeseen. Principally, when we start with an operation of uh, running the blast furnace slower, that means less blast, less, less oxygen, slower charging rates, slower fuel rate, then yes, we do have the equipment and the equipment um, is just operating in a, in a lower rate. Though that will already have an impact on our operation. So with the changes on the blast conditions, we change also the gas volume and uh, that can result in a change of speed at the two years. Changes to the fuel injection will demand for the operation a modification of the, of the burden in the furnace. This is an area when we're coming to the slowdown of the furnace, um, which we need to control and we, which we need to plan ahead. ahead. That is the, um, the phase where an experience is important together with the right equipment and the tools to do the planning. Because um, in the next phase or in the, in the furnace, we will see from these modifications now um, the first reactions. So with the change of the gas, the gas overall gas distribution in the blast furnace will change. With the modification on the fuel injection, we will have different thermal control scheme on the blast furnace, which can then result in issues such as difficulties with the, blast with the blast furnace burden descent. A blast furnace can easily tend to create wall accretions in these phases. And uh, also very common are then problems with um, hot metal temperature and um, chemical issues of slack and hot metal. So overall, this is a phase um, that is key to such an operation because here we need to closely monitor um, the behavior of the blast furnace and to take quick actions. Because if at the end it is, uh, we fail to, um, to control the furnace in this phase, um, there are certain risks that can occur. So um, among the typical risk are um, a pronounced loss of two years, the risk of a chilled blast furnace, and in generally that leading um, to the risk of unplanned blast furnace stoppages to be to increase. And this is then an area um, where the blast furnace leaves us as only possibility to react to what the blast furnace is dictating. So the Paul Wood portfolio offers several solutions to properly control the blast furnace during uh, these difficult times of, of slowdown. So there's of course the Paul Wood um, ballast top, um, which allows for under all um, circumstances for um, adjusting of the charging of the furnace in by this to a major extent on, on the blast furnace working. There is exact regulation of um, blast and uh, production weight with the blast system. There is reliable PCI plant um, technology to adjust and control the fuel injection also at lowered injection set points. And these technologies, they are complemented with a wide variety of um, BFX expert models um, that allow to um, control areas of the furnace, but also allow to plan ahead for burden distribution um, for um, two year blast distribution for hot metal chemistry and so on. And we had discussed um, before um, that the blast furnace in slowdown is demanding typically significantly more attention. 
So uh, probes, automation models, condition monitoring, all of that has proven their values on blast furnace in top performance. It should also be pointed out that particularly in, uh, in difficult times that uh, demand a lot of control, those tools can come in particularly handy. And um, out of the um, port world, port, uh, port world portfolio that we're having here, I'd uh, like to show in particular the newer probes from our joint venture with TMT, the SOMA system and the uh, uh, 3D top scan. Um, those uh, new probes allow for a three-dimensional visualization of the blast furnace top for the temperature and the burden profile, which will allow for an insanely fast reaction to any changes on the blast furnace condition. There are um, also models in BF Expert that, uh, that support the monitoring of, of the furnace, like a thermal control um, of, the, of, of the staves that uh, helps with the identification of scaffolds in the furnace or um, our two-year phenomena detection system. When it then comes to the impact of these special operations um, on the equipment, and there an example might be an operation with an insanely high top gas temperature. Um, the newer condition monitoring systems for our equipment um, can support uh, the, the user with providing the, the information on the equipment. Particularly in the field of Blast furnace automation, there are many more models and functionalities um, which are included in our BF expert system. And uh, due to the limited time in this presentation, I'd like just to show an overview of the different models which are included. So may it now be for economic or may it be for process reasons. Sometimes um, longer blast furnaces stoppages cannot be avoided. And where we can say that um, the operation of stoppage and restart are for many plants a standard, standard operation, then uh, we still have the situation that in particular longer blast furnace stoppages depending on the plant experience are not that frequently executed. So that means that also the experience on site can be, can be limited and uh, the occurrences did not allow to establish any best practice on that. And unfortunately, that also goes together with the fact um, that we have in such situations a higher potential for failures than there is in the regular operation, which also means that uh, it can even come to the point of endangering equipment lifetime. So for these situations, um, um, pol pol -word service, um, pol -word services that can be offered include um, the creation or the review of procedures or plannings um, on site in order to come to best practice operation. Um, they can include salamander tapping as a turnkey solution, um, Durfee pipe or oxyfuel lens to support blow in or recovery. And customers can benefit here from our worldwide network of colleagues uh, with process and operation experience and also our global references on that. <clears throat> so, and in the following, the two points of salamander tapping and um, Durfee pipe, I'd like to uh, show a bit more in detail. So, Paul Wood offers engineering and assistance for the complete package of a salamander tapping. So, this includes um, analyze and diagnosis of the safety and um, the hazards starting with the procedures and process calculations already with the blow down of the furnace, then the complete package of engineering, planning and uh, assistance to the operation. 
It includes the core drilling and particular here the definition of the, uh, the core drilling location, la the later management of the liquids and uh, finish with the tap hole closing procedure. So a bit more in detail, um, the support includes the following steps. Um, it starts there with an analyze of the thermocouple data that are available of the HERS. Such data is fed into um, the Paul Wood uh, HERS lining model in order to uh, elaborate the, uh, the current erosion profile of the HERS. Based on this, uh, this information, a definition is made for the um, uh, whole location and its inclination, and that is then combined with an on-site assistance during the core drilling. Then the package also inc includes the engineering and uh, installation for uh, the necessary runners on the iron notch. Um, for the salamander, the installation of the core, core drilling machine and the later handling uh, preparation for the, um, for the torpedoes and uh, handling of liquids. Then the procedure finishes um, um, with um, a close, closing of the um, of the drilling hole, which includes the delivery of that of the carbon block together with its machining and the later installation. So um, support can also be provided um, for the restart of blast furnace and in particular this is used for the specifically challenging cases when there is a recovery from a chilled half. Typically such an operation always consists of three main steps. So it is starting with an understanding of the condition of the furnace and the possible root causes of a hearse chilling because on every furnace every time these situations are very different. It then continues with an introduction of heat into the furnace with the target to create a stable connections between tap holes and two years and is then concluded uh, with the sequential opening of two years in order to bring the furnace back to normal operation. So in the first step, Philip, Philip, sorry to interrupt you, but perhaps that your presentation is not at the screen anymore. Could you check it, please? Okay. Is it back? Yeah, yes, now it's now okay. It's okay. But okay. Now it's okay. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, uh, um, please uh, excuse the technical uh, inconveniences there. Um, uh, yeah, back to the un uh, unpleasant situation of a, uh, of a chilled earth then. Um, so in, this, in the first step that we're having there, um, it is necessary to uh, determine the situation that, that is there and also um, to uh, take the uh, whole picture of the blast furnace into consideration. So in case there are repairs to be made before that re revival, um, this is executed. Then it is to get an understanding of the BF operation before the stoppage. So in particular, what were the burden characteristics in the BF? What, were, what is the fuel rate? understand the two-year conditions, understand if there have been water leaks in the lower part of the, of the furnace and um, understand uh, the situation on the level of the liquids in the hearth. So our preferred solution for the introduction of um, heat to the furnace is so-called um, Durfee pipe. 
Um, Durfee pipe is an older concept, um, but has gone uh, through some substantial improvements by Paul Word. Basically, that system um, consists of a steamless piping, um, several valves, standard thermocouples, pressure transmitters. And the idea that is here is that it creates a bypass line between the two year stalks and the tapple. So from this bypass line, we have the possibility to introduce to the hearth hot blast enriched with oxy oxygen, um, in which we see the advantages that we have there, a safe production of these gases, meaning also that no additional media is uh, necessary to be handled um, on, on cast floor, and um, that is providing um, the highest level of energy input. Technology-wise, um, this is then um, combined with some um, spe special valves, um, some special two-year arrangements in order to avoid or at least minimize uh, stoppages on, on the blast furnace. And it's also combined with special two-year plug design um, that allows for thermal monitoring of the situations in front of the two years. So um, during the recovery and the step three, the sequential opening of two years, once a connection has, has been, uh, been made, um, the three major points uh, to uh, consider when opening the two years is first, that we need to prevent any accidental self-opening of the two years because we want to avoid that the furnace is starting to produce in an area that is not yet ready or not connected to the tapo. We want to minimize the number of shutdowns of the furnace because every shutdown is resulting in uh, a newer energy loss on the furnace. And also we want to have a timely um, and reliable opening of the two years in order to avoid a two year burning um, by a delayed opening. So for that also um, within our uh, services for the um, recovery, um, we have um, an improved um, two year opening procedure, including special plugs and also including special drilling tool, which allows then for an improved safety of the operators, avoids furnace stoppages, and also increase the reliability and speed of the two year opening. For that, I'd like to give um, two examples of um, operations where we where we have uh, recently used these technologies. Um, one is a bit older from 2014, but it's one of personal experience from my side, so I included it. Um, we had the blast furnace with a severe chilled hearth condition as that furnace went um, into, after some incidents, into a six months shutdown, un unplanned. So um, the services by Paul Wirt that we were provided here were the engineering of the necessary plant modifications for the Durfee pipe installation, um, the elaboration of operational procedures with an associated risk analyze, and then the operational assistance on, on site. So on this furnace, um, as we see on the right, um, um, two, at two tap holes, the Sturfy pipe technology was installed. The results of that uh, were really promising, although um, that really long stoppage time of the blast furnace, um, half of the two years had been opened within the first five days. Um, it was less than, less than two weeks um, for having all two years opened and the operation was done with only one shorter stoppage um, in the whole operation. Another experience um, in Europe from uh, last year, um, blast furnace in a severe chilled hearth condition. And um, unfortunately also the furnace went un uh, through several unsuccessful restart attempts by the customer which have uh, worsened the situation, meaning that um, um, already a certain part of, of coke that was still available got consumed by those attempts. 
similar level of uh, services provided by Paul Wirt as in the previous example. Um, just in addition here, um, the operation was also combined with um, repair works um, on, the, on, on the blast furnace hearth. In this case, half of the two years opened within 11 days. Um, there has been one major shutdown in between, which was in relation to the, to the repair works, and that therefore delayed the operation a little bit. So in coming to a conclusion, I hope uh, that uh, during the last minutes um, I could give you an overview on the Polward technology in our service por portfolio that support the operation by providing equipment that allows for the control under many circumstance circumstances, sophisticated probes for monitoring of the process, models and automation to plan and adjust as well as many references in successful blast furnace recoveries and uh, proven technology for the salamander tapping. I thank you very much. Philippe, thank you a lot for such interesting presentation. Now we're gonna have our third speaker, Mr. Dieter Bettinger from Prime Metal Technologies Austria Dieter with the presentation, Stable and Optimized Blast Furnace Operation in Turbulent Times. Mr. Dieter Bettinger is the Product Manager Aeromake Automation and, and Optimization from Pi Metals. He was born in Saarbrücken, Germany in 1963, but usually lives in Austria, Europe. He has a master's degree in physics. He also was head of European Steel Technology Platform Project for Intelligent Manufacturing. He did the management and project supervision in various international projects as an automation engineer and expert in energy efficiency. Another professional achievements, Energy Globe for Process Optimization Blast Furnace. So, Mr. Dieter, thank you very much for your presence. And before you start your presentation, I have a question for you. I see here that you have five boys. Will <laughs> any of them be a blessed furnace, man? <laughs> a good question, yeah. <laughs> now, um, in fact, three of them are already in different fields and the two younger ones are maybe causing some troubles in today's presentation, but let us... Uh, Hope for the best, yeah. That's a great profession. Stable and optimized blast furnace operation in turbulent times. I will start my presentation with a look back in history. So Fristalpina is a landlocked company. This means the transportation costs are significantly higher than for other companies, leading to a competitive disadvantage. And this led 30 years ago almost to a shutdown of the whole iron making. However, they decided then to do everything they could to reduce the hot metal costs. And one part of that was that they invested in, a, they decided to go for a low grade philosophy regarding the raw material quality, buy material on the spot market and so on. And this naturally led to high raw material fluctuations. In order to achieve a hot metal um, and slag quality in a stable range and a, and a stable blast furnace operation, they at the same time decided to invest in process optimization. And this was the starting point of a very long lasting cooperation between First Alpine and our company, um, where we continuously try to, to, to improve the process optimization system that's attached to the blast furnace. Um, what are the targets of this process optimization system? Uh, the overall target is, of course, to, to cut the, to reduce the hot metal cost as far as possible and to achieve a stable and high performance operation. So the part, uh, uh, partly goals are to reduce the fuel consumption, reduce steam addition and avoid, of course, 
critical process situations and at the same time increase the productivity and achieve a stable product quality. If I'm speaking about turbulences, um, then first of all, it can be related to the raw material feed. So changing raw materials uh, with different quality, um, the, the, the challenge between fresh sinter and coke and uh, this material from the uh, these materials from the stock and all the the chemical physical uh, uh, parameters in particular moisture if they're fluctuating yeah. on the demand side uh, in particular in, in times of um of this pandemic for instance um, challenges can can come from from a fluctuating hot metal demand in the worst case this can lead to a stop and go operation. Both, of course, are additional challenges for running uh, the, the furnace in an efficient way. So I would like to highlight now or explain now from a very high level of uh, view, um, what are the central functions of a state-of-the-art automation system? And first of all, you need to digitize what is going on in the process. So you need sensors. These sensors produce data, but data is not what you're interested in. You're interested in the information that's conveyed by the data. And to, to unleash these, this information, you classically use models, in the best case up to a digital twin, then status diagnosis, which can be um, status diagnosis of, of the process or of the equipment. In the second case, um, this would be um, condition monitoring. In the first case, this is the part of the expert system, for instance. And then you want to find out which of this bunch of information is relevant for your operation and there is a business intelligence an important step here you try to get the the foundation and the kpis that you can use for uh, uh, fact-based decision making and finally we come to data analytics uh, this is uh, the method of choice if you want to find out new patterns within your data where you maybe don't even yet know which data are relevant all this information is then um, offered to, to operations to enhance their knowledge. At the same time, you have the inverse problem to digitize the knowledge of your specialists and operators. And first of all, um, and this is a fact that's often not considered in the control loops of the automation system, um, a lot of um, knowledge is contained. And you will notice that if you once come to a plant with a low automation level, um, then you see that you need significantly more knowledge to run this plant. However, usually if we think of, of um, digitizing knowledge, we think of more flexible systems, not so hardwired topics, uh, but uh, knowledge bases as a part of the expert system or digital assistance. And finally, um, we have data-driven uh, models. They are the twin brother of data analytics, and they try to directly incorporate the patterns that you have found by data analytics within the process control system. And this leads me to a very central point, um, very important um, paradigm for how we design our automation system. This is information and knowledge without doing something with it, without action, is completely useless. And so we always aim for standardized action triggered by our automation system that are finally executed by the actuators and robotics. And because this is so central for, for, for our perspective, I would like to repeat it. So first, you digitize the plant, then you try to extract the relevant information from the data, then you find out what information is relevant to enhance your knowledge, then you want to digitize the existing knowledge, and finally you want to come to standardized actions to run your plant. 
And today I would like to, to highlight all these points with examples, and I will start with the smart sensors. So there have been many sensors developed recently to, to improve um, the understanding what, of what is going on inside of the blast furnace. And as one picture transports more information uh, than, um, than a long sentence, um, they, they are very valuable, in, in particular in critical operational situations. However, they have a few disadvantages. First of all, they're typically standalone um, solutions. Then you know, they need a high storage demand, which often leads to the fact that they are not stored for, for all the um, um, blast furnace campaign time. But the biggest disadvantage um, compared to classical measure, measurement is that you cannot trend them and you cannot use them to correlate it with other information. If you try to trend a, a picture, something like a, a movie comes up. And so while it's providing good information about the current situation, it's difficult to analyze the, 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 what is um, combined um, and what is correlated to other actions and to, to other information. So what uh, what what we therefore developed is uh, a system that integrates all these data and the second thing is that it extracts relevant parameters for further analysis trend analysis and correlation analysis generally i think it's very important that that you should avoid information islands but you always should try to combine all data sources into one big system this leads me to the system process and data management system. I will not speak about the software architecture. I will, you know, the system is designed to store the data for a long time. What, what is very important um, that this system should be flexible and, and, and be ready for changing boundary conditions. So the system should display a high modularity and a high configurability in particular. So if, you, if you're new, challenges can come up, you always um, should keep the same system and just have to change the parameters. However, if, if, if you have a new idea for a new model, for instance, then it again should support you. And for this, we created something we call the Metallurgical Model Builder, which is a, a scripting language that supports metallurgical and thermodynamical problems. And uh, it contains all reaction enthalpies, material properties and, and equilibrium constants. So to support you to build your own models. And once you have been building your own models, and this can be simple models up to, to very complex ones, then you might want to visualize them. And for this, we have an application designer. You can create new applications, design them, and then use them. And this can be very complex applications, like here, the expert system or the plant visualization that have been created using the application designer. So the next topic are models, and usually they have a high priority in, in such discussions. I will just um, briefly highlight that it's natural that they are very important to extract relevant information to support you in critical operational times in particular. So the, the prediction of the, the burn distribution, the tracking of the material descent to the shaft, the, the prediction of the hot metal parameters, the, the information of the shape of the cohesive zone, um, then in the long run, what is the current operation? How is it influencing the, the wear of, of, of your furnace? And then, of course, the, the first phase, the single phase and double phase um, mass and energy balances. So the, the burden calculation and, and the, the wrist diagram CDRR uh, model. And not to forget um, models which are related at the blast simulation or the hot stove model to the auxiliary um, um, parts of the plant, which are very important if you have a fluctuating um, um, and changing uh, conditions. So um, with this, I would like to come to the way how to, 
to, to extract the, the, the relevant knowledge out of the, this big bunch of information. And we'll start with the business intelligence. This is more or less just um, a tool to provide you the, um, the, the base data for, for fact-driven decision making. And I always refer to it as a, as a kind of interactive reporting where you can change and modify your reports easily. So you have ad hoc views um, with an interactive report designer where you don't need to be a specialist. No IT knowledge is required. And if you are familiar with uh, pivot tables from Excel, for instance, it will be very easy for you to use them. And once you define such a report, you can integrate it into dashboards and then you can um, put these dashboards together with just drag and drop uh, as a self-service on demand. And um, of course, you can save these dashboards and um, offer them and share them with colleagues. So with the next topic, I would like to come to matrix mining. Matrix mining is nothing than um, tracking um, the, 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 the automatic tracking of the charging matrices and store them together with a performance indicator, with a key performance indicator that have been created using this matrix. So code grade, um, hot metal temperature, hot metal silicon or productivity. And you store this together with a matrix and then over the time you will uh, create a database and if you want have to um, uh, want to decide what um, matrix which distribution is the most suitable for a new burden mix then you can type in the burden mix optimization targets and uh, potential limits then the, the matrix mining will suggest you which matrix did the best performance in the past and suggest you this uh, this matrix for further usage. Next topic is the data analysis. And data analytics, if I'm speaking about that, this I always refer to two um, main tools. One is artificial intelligence and the other is uh, methods are covered that are covered are statistical methods. And you apply data analytics to find new patterns in your data. So how do you do that? You first select the data, add features. Adding features is nothing more than adding first principle models. Then you clean and integrate them, transform them because they are often in the format of, of um, um, relational databases in the normalized format. And this is very complex, but you would like to have a simple shape um, for your data analytics. And then you discretize, categorize them and end up with a rectangular shape. In the first column, there is an identifier and in the different lines, you have the fingerprints that support the solving of your problem. And this preparation is very time consuming. It takes usually 80% of the time and is efficiently supported by our data analytics add-on. So once you have the prepared data, you can analyze them and you can do either do this with a professional toolbox which is um, meant to be used by by data scientists covering statistics and artificial intelligence so both um, supervised and unsupervised methods so convolutionary neural network and whatever and you have um, a more intuitive um, visual analysis that is supported by the metallurgical pattern analyzer to identify patterns in your data so once you found um, patterns and gained additional insights, you can basically to do uh, a few things. First of all, you could deploy data-driven models for further usage. But I always recommend to consider to use this additional information to change and optimize already existing physical models because they have the advantage that they are transparent. And it could be used to to, to change the rules how you want to run your plant uh, with improved expert system rules here. I would like to give an example how we applied this for uh, the thermal control of the, the blast furnace. You use all the process parameters and then have an artificial intelligence uh, powered um, prediction of the hot metal temperature, sulfur and silicon content. 
and um, then you use this prediction in order to optimize the reducing agent control in order to achieve a stable hot metal quality. For this, we apply a hybrid model. So the process data are first um, uh, um, used by a first principles model. And the result of this is fed into a long short term memory um, model, so a neural network and a support vector machine. So both are artificial intelligence tools. And then we have an um, evaluation um, module that finally decides what is the, the prediction and we achieve by that a significantly better and more accurate result than just by a first principle model, a principles model. I already mentioned that this is uh, used then by the uh, by the control, and so I would like to go switch over to the expert system. Our uh, control actions are done by the expert system, and at the same time, it's the basis where you digitize your knowledge. So the expert system um, makes a process diagnosis of the current condition of the, the blast furnace process. Then it provides corrective actions to improve this status. And this is sim simultaneously the coke rate, burden basicity, oxygen enrichment, the, the, the fuel injections, the steam addition, and the fine tuning of burden distribution in it. These are the standard actions. So uh, in, in some cases, we have up to 20 um, such actions that can be executed simultaneously. The number is defined uh, in the initial pro process uh, project phase. On top of this, you get an information about the reason why these corrective actions were su suggested and get an explanation how and why this has been calculated. So with this, I would like to, to say how this is done. Of course, it's uh, executed in closed loop. And the basis for that is first the knowledge base. And the knowledge base contain, contains of a um, general part from that has been designed by Crystal Pine and the experience of the recent 100, more than 100 successful projects that we have executed. And then it's um, always individually uh, specified and, and customized for the different blast furnace. And for this, we have a, a rule editor. So these rules can be modified later on and should be modified later on. A special feature of the expert system is that it closely cooperates with the process model. So it doesn't only use the information coming from the process models, but uses them as an operator would use them interactively and I would like to give one example here um, by, uh, by showing um, how the fine tuning of the burden distribution is done. So you have a, a charging matrix and a related a, a distribution of the material, but you might find that the temperature in the furnace top uh, doesn't fit to your targets. So the expert system in this case makes an automatic suggestion how to change and adjust the distribution so indicated by here by the red uh, numbers. And this was uh, roughly one day after that, uh, you, you see that the, the temperature profile um, matches the target temperature profile. So here you see the, the user interface of the expert system. It's, uh, you can see in the upper part, the diagnosis in the left hand side, the controls and uh, right hand side the related trends for these controls in, in the different tabs and in the bottom the actions suggested by the expert system and um, at the same time if you click at these you will get an explanation why these suggestions have been made if you reject such an action you're asked to fill in a reasoning why you rejected them. And I will come to this point later on why this is important. So I would like to give three examples, uh, two examples of, um, of applications of the expert system. One thing is the, sh the shutdown and startup package. So you can define here action plans for different shutdown durations. 
And for each of these durations, you can then define actions like the extra code batch, um, changing uh, the, the slack basicity and so on. And this is then mirrored in, in, a, in a shutdown plan, a shutdown template. And once you define it, once you select the shutdown plan, you will enter the start and end time. And then the system will automatically provide you with a detailed schedule based on the current productivity and, and the, the, the actual blast pressure or the, the blast flow rate and guide you automatically through all the actions. So for, for this critical um, um, shutdown and startup phase, you will get a, a safe and standardized guidance through the expert system. The next topic I would like to, to highlight is uh, the PCI ramp up functions. So it, uh, you achieve a very precise thermal control because you can always execute the defined ramping patterns. And you see here a two stepwise reduction of the charged burden and at the same time or with a certain delay, then a ramping up of the PCI in order to always have a stable um, thermal process control. Um, if you now uh, have all these rules applied, the question is how do you create these rules? And I would like to come to that point. Um, as I mentioned, we have, of course, uh, uh, quite an experience from, from a lot of different blast is how um, these rules can be set up. However, there's always a challenge that not all this information is explicit. There is a lot of, a lot of um, knowledge in the, the minds of their uh, operators um, that is difficult to extract. They, 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 a lot of people run the blast furnace from their guts feeling. And uh, this is often very important and, and very um, uh, critical to, to, to also incorporate such knowledge into the system. And for this, we have a structured approach and finally, we will implement the, the knowledge in, in, in the knowledge base of the expert system. However, the story is not over then because um, the system needs to be flexible. And I mentioned first that the operators have the possibility to reject actions. And this is something that you can use to get feedback and yet that you can use for a continuous improvement. So finally, the expert system knowledge base should um, reflect a digitized uh, version of the knowledge that is required to run the plant. Um, I would like to, to, to give a short example of a less prominent part of the blast furnace. This is the hot blast stove system. But this is in critical in, in cases of, 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 of changing boundary conditions because it has to be ready to allow for changing duty. And of course, you always try to have the other goals like reduce the energy costs, a safe and standardized operation and, and, and increase the blast temperature as much as possible. And our stove expert supports you here. So, um, a typical feature of a stove system if it's to code then it will run however if uh, um, a disturbance like an increase of duty like a higher blast furnace uh, blast uh, demand or a higher blast temperature demand then it can become critical and you might end up with a situation where you don't get enough energy into the stove system so you, the only possible reaction then is to, to that you reduce the blast temperature again. For this reason, many operators um, try to, to run the stoves quite hot. This is, uh, will pro, uh, give you some um, space in, in case of changing duty. However, it's not efficient. So you have high losses here. And the idea of the stove expert system is to, to run the stoves exactly on a well-defined um, heat reserve above the required um, minimal load that you're ready for such disturbances, but at the same time um, have an efficient operation. 
So what are the benefits of, um, of the process optimization system that we achieved? So this was the initial targets that we mentioned when the development was started and typically you will achieve uh, um, reduce a, a reduction of the, the fuel consumption higher than five kilogram and a stabilized quality. So a reduction of the standard deviation more than 10%. And this is depending on the size of your furnace, um, uh, very attractive because it will, will achieve uh, payback times in the range typically of a few months. So what I presented up to now, or what I discussed up to now is a, a, a local optimization of the blast furnace. And I would like to add on a different system um, to simulate the whole iron and steel making area. And this is a tool which helps um, the procurement, raw material procurement and uh, department and the strategic planning department to optimize the overall process to find what is the best operational strategy and which raw material is the best for us. And for this, this system um, mirrors the plant configuration and it covers not only the main plants, but all the auxiliary plants, including the power plant, it covers material data and costs and um, the, the energy and material flows, including the byproducts. And, and what is special about is that it has really advanced metallurgical models inside. So a typical problem that could be solved is you have a reduced production, which operation is more efficient with three blast furnace operation or two blast furnace operation. And um, both alternatives are then evaluated, uh, the, um, both in, in terms of the, the technical parameters as well as the financial parameters. And then you get a suggestion which operation serves you um, um, to, to have the minimal conversion costs. So I would like to, to wrap up and summarize what I presented today. The plant process needs to be digitized. Then you want it to extract the relevant information from the data and provide critical information to your operational personnel. Then you have the other inverse problem that you want to digitize the knowledge, which you can do within the expert system and then come to a standardized action. And by that, you will achieve uh, support of your operation. And by this, you will get the support of your blast furnace operation, which will be in particular important in turbulent times. So, Mr. Dieter, thank you, thank you a lot for your interesting presentation. So, in fact, thank you for the all the speakers. We had uh, interesting presentations here, very updated and according to our needs, our current needs. Okay. So now we're going to start our debate according to the questions that were sent via chat. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I will start uh, with a, a, a point for the whole speakers, for the three speakers. Uh, uh, both of you explored about the experience of the operators. And since we have a lack of experience here in Brazil, we'd like to hear from you opinions or suggestions on how can we improve the technical knowledge of the operators. Do you have there in your countries, in your different countries, any program to integrate the companies with the universities? Do you have any other opinion on that? And another question related to the knowledge, more for the specialists. Uh, too much was talk about advanced analytics. What would be the formation of this professional, the profile of this professional uh, to work on that issue? So it's it's with you. Would we'll start with you, Philip? In, in general, that is uh, an important point for having qualified staff on on site, because um, 
as it was uh, also also mentioned in the in the first presentation um, running into a troubled operation can go rather quickly and it's typically a combination of uh, uh, several events happening at the same at, at, at the same time and very often you know, from time to time some direct failure but very often linked also to somebody not paying attention so therefore the qualification is good um, but at the end the difficulty is that you will only learn from the participation in these in these events which um, is um, uh, luckily not happening so often um, but with a regular exchange also uh, uh, of people in the plant, some, some knowledge drain in the plant, we see it more and more difficult to build up an experience there. And in addition to that, we see also um, that um, the exchange of plants on a technical, on a technical level well, in, in between different companies is, uh, is decreasing over the years. So um, therefore, um, these uh, also, like it was presented here two times today, um, the possibility to have a support, uh, to have uh, companies with people who are seeing those issues on different furnaces, in different places in the world, and uh, can share their experience. Um, may I add something to that? Please, please. Yeah. Um, so, so I fully agree. <laughs> And I would like to pick up one point that Rob mentioned in his presentation first. So he said um, that he's concerned about um, maybe um, taking too much responsibility from, from the operators with, an, with the control. And, and to some extent, this can be true. Th this would be wrong if the operators and the process engineers do not feel responsible if they have um, a, a, cl a clever or smart system supporting them. So th this can be an issue, but it can be um, used in a different way. Um, if you have an, an, an expert system, then it will provide suggestions. And in a good um, operation, the operators will not just look at it and say, OK, it said something, I will accept. But they will try to, to to, to, to bring in their own point of view. And this can be in particular interesting for, for newcomers on the site, because then they will have a guidance and they then they say, okay, why did the, was this reasoning made? Why did this happen? And this can help them um, to, 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 to get uh, a better feeling how to run, run a plant. So it's, um, first of all, this, this training that you, you can get from, from, an, from a, such a system, if you actively try to 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 look at the the results, and the other thing, um, in some plants uh, we know that the people for one shift in in one month or so they, that they have to make their own decisions without the system, or they are just not allowed to run it in closed loop, but only in, in advisory mode. So um, yes, it's important to um, to get um, to to take care of your people. It's not only that uh, the system will make the people dumb, it can be used to make the people more smart. I fully agree with you, Dieter, fully agree with you. Rob, do you, do you have anything to add on this? Yeah, I, th I, have, a, I have something to add on that. Um, I, I have been uh, supporting uh, companies who ended up in a big disaster, totally relying on uh, expert systems and what I learned in that experience is that these operators were running so much time in in, in a standard operation uh, mode uh, also not experiencing any problems because of all these expert systems the the risk of big problems has reduced over the years it's not it's not it's not gone but it has reduced so that knowledge is is yeah is is more or less gone so what our approach is is that that well you know maybe uh, the book uh, we uh, as daniel chorus uh, support but also uh, uh, put our experience in and uh, the new 
the new book is out uh, just since uh, a few weeks, the, uh, the modern blast furnace I am making. Uh, we do a, a course on that. We can organize that and support uh, companies to, to tell everything about our practical uh, experience and, and what, what to be careful for and what to look after. But also inside the company, you have to organize it. Um, I've been working uh, uh, beginning of the 80s that was developed. That, that book was just starting at that time together with uh, uh, Marta Keres was, was starting that point. And uh, I, I was part of that, that training, that, that development. And what I learned in that time is that the operators were so much empowered that a lot of decision making can, can be done lower in the organization. But you have, to, you have to keep that learning experience continuous. So what, uh, what, what we uh, recommend to organize is a two monthly or four yearly uh, sitting together of all the operators and the uh, technology managers to evaluate every, uh, uh, how you call it, disruption in, in operations which happened in the last months. That's the only way to, to get this continuous uh, uh, improvement. And, and I, do, I do agree with, with Prime Met Metals that an expert system is a very good way to, to operate a furnace and to assure that everybody takes the same decisions. But especially when you go out of your normal oper operating uh, uh, bandwidth, then, then you, you have to rely on the knowledge of the people. They really have to understand what's happening inside the furnace. And what I also see when, when I come on site to plants is that a lot of instrumentation is over time not reliable anymore. It's, you're, you're missing information. And the only way to, to counteract on that is an experienced operator who understands that if that measurement is not working correctly, that he has to take, to take some other actions. And that's, that's a little bit my, my problem. Uh, in, in my, my, I, I've been working in uh, Linde for quite some while in operations and also in plant performance improvement. And there we had a very good experts, uh, expert model expert system, which was quite easy to program because why? The raw materials is air and air is almost everywhere in the world the same. You, you can filter it, take some, some stuff out and you have clean air and the rest is electricity. So it's easy to automate. And what I see at blast furnaces is there is always some guy at procurement who finds a cheap pellet or a cheap lump ore put it in the furnace, uh, they save some money on one side and they lose a huge amount of money on the other side. So I still, I believe in expert systems for sure. I don't reject them, but I, 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 I don't like to run them in closed loop. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. I fully agree with you. Now I have a question for Mr. Dieter. Uh, mm -hmm. Dieter. Uh, could you please tell us a, a little bit more about best results in terms of cook rate and productivity at best furnace that use expert systems? Um, so uh, what I, I have not in my mind is, is now uh, the absolute figures here. So it's um, uh, and, and you know it, um, comparing the absolute figures is is maybe uh, over oversimplifying the topic because you really should put into relation um, the performance of the furnace and the, the boundary conditions. So the raw material the different plants are using. So uh, I, I, I will, I think I will not give you here now an answer for that because it's it's, it's simply unfair if you have like uh, a furnace we are with high alkali load or, 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 or with the highest slag load or whatever uh, that that creates different conditions and um, so um, what I think is that you can achieve um, with the standardized practice an improved operation that's that's the statement that I, I would give and I even cannot give you here absolute numbers um, because um, again it de depends on um, if, if you now, for instance, uh, consider the installation of an expert system that you always have to see what was the situation before, um, how well 
uh, was the, the operation done and, and, and how uh, is the state situation after. And just to, to give me one uh, sentence to respond to Rob, um, for me it's clear, um, operators are important and they have to take the responsibility, that's clear. So I, I do not support at all something where uh, an operation where the operators uh, leave the responsibility so to some system. This is not the idea of the system. Okay, Dieter, you're, you're fully right. Uh, specifically in Tubarão plant, we are also wor working hard at adv advanced analytics. So it's in the initial stage, okay? But we, we believe that we're going to have pretty good results by using such uh, advanced analytic systems. Okay, thank you, thank you a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have a question now for Philip. Philip, uh, what do you think about the companies which do, don't have uh, a good instrumentation? What would be the reliability of the expert system, and, and what's the suggestion that you have? Um, short answer, it depends. Longer <laughs> answer. Um, to give you to give you an example, um, uh, one for example, one model that we're having there, um, where I was working working in the development of, of of this one, and it's about the hearth, and mainly at the end, it's doing a balance of the of the liquids produced going in and uh, and liquids going out. Oh, so. Um, we wrote, wrote everything and put it there at the end. Yeah, if you have super good measurement of what you put in the furnace, super good measurement on the quantities that you tap and that in the best way online, um, the model will w work fantastically. OK, we had that in hand and we saw that if you have all that information, you don't need a model in between. So it's one example um, where we extended that. So that in the input to this model, you can make the selection, whether you have all the data, uh, whether you have that um, tapping from the furnace, or uh, you maybe only get a few hours later an, a hot metal weighing from your steel shop. Uh, then this will be the input, but there will be a sub model in between uh, that is making, uh, providing you a corrected online rate on the on the hot metal or even if this um, if the if the weighing is not there then you will have another sub model that is in principally evaluating it from some other measurements on the blast runs of course always that means that you lose accu accuracy uh, with the uh, uh, the saying in automation shit in shit out uh, that that will always be um, the point um, Though expert systems are designed to operate with their core functionalities normally with information that is available in any case. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Philip. I, I fully agree with you also. Now I have a question for Rob. Rob. Tell us a little bit about uh, the role of auxiliary fuels, in particular natural gas, in the flexible operations of the blast furnace. What can you tell us about the natural gas for the blast furnace? What, uh, what, what do you mean by, by natural gas and flexibility of the, of the furnace? You, you mean by a recovery of a furnace, by an oxy fuel lens? Or? By op normal operation of the furnace using co-injection, natural gas and PCI. Ah, co-injection. Okay. Ah, well, every every uh, reduced uh, productivity of a blast furnace, you you have to. It, it's it's not it's not a one one thing off. It's not it's not that you say okay uh, you you have to go to fifty percent. You have to do this and you have to do that. There is much more related uh, to that. Uh, f first of all, you, you talk about everything, what's what's going around the blast furnace. If you go to, well, we say that the minimum, minimum uh, where you can go to is about 50% 50, 50 of the design of the furnace. That's, that's more or less the minimum, then you will get into trouble. Then you have to find out what kind of uh, 
uh, logistics are taking place. Eh? In, in, if, if you take into account that if you go to 50% and you still have your uh, your comp plant full running, you will have a, a problem in the stockyard. So you have to counteract on that. Possibly you have to reduce PCI. Then you come into some other problem. Some PCI systems are not built to run at 50% of their capacity. Uh, what, what I see in many, many PCI systems, I see that you have to close lenses on, on, on the furnace to, to assure that you uh, have enough uh, uh, velocity in the lenses, which will kill your process, your gas distribution also. So for natural gas, it will be much easier because natural gas, you can ramp it up and down from, from zero to, to 100. So for that point of view, I would like, uh, I would uh, appreciate natural gas more than PCI in the low ranges of uh, operating a blast furnace with the current PCI systems. And then I talk generally about dense phase systems. Uh, what, I, what, I, what I see with a lot of dense phase systems, they are not able to run lower than 60% of their um, capacity without uh, closing lenses, which I do not like at all. So natural gas is 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 a nice, uh, a, a better injectant than than PCI in the current uh, industry. I think. Okay, Rob. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Uh, so we still have some few minutes. I have a question for you. Uh, we discussed a lot about the importance of a good raw material. In the other way, if you have poor raw material, you can have a serious problem as a, a chilled half at the blast furnace. So do you have any disruptive technology or are you developing something to anticipate the identification of some raw material degradation? <laughs> Who could comment on that? Wow. Yeah, that's 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 a very nice question. Um, well, 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 what I see when I work uh, the world around, I'm, I'm not a real uh, raw material specialist. One one of the guys in my team is, is is that guy. But what we see is that that we can get same good results with different sorts of raw materials. Where sometimes you say, well, this is not suitable, but it's still working, and. Um, if, if, if you do the chemical and physical analysis of, of some raw materials, you think it's it's OK, the material is OK, but you put it in a blast furnace and it behaves different. And that's that 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 keeps on being being uh, uh, a, a difficulty. Uh, also, the way how um, the the tests are done, there are worldwide, there are more ISO tests available. And they can they can difficult be compared. Some some are only uh, in, in a small part of the reduction process of the furnace. Others, uh, like here at uh, uh, Tata Hoge ovens, uh, they have a full uh, simulation of the of the Hoge ovens process of the blast furnace process. So yeah, for me it's it's difficult to get to get 100% clear if you can apply another uh, raw material without changing your process. Um, maybe I would like to give a, a short comment on that. Um, first, I think this was again in Rob's presentation. He mentioned um, that there were two bins, the material of, 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 of in the bin, which was, was supposed to be coke, was gravel or something like that. So um, for this, and this is a kind of um, uh, simple problem but with potential disastrous consequences for this we have for instance a solution that uh, by an acoustic method provides you information what material is going in and i think in general um, uh, additional instrumentation for the raw material is something where i see um, certain developments going on because we have only limited information um, about the physical property of the raw material going in and um, this is maybe the, the, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest topics that, that we don't have, uh, continuous information 
about uh, grain size and other uh, physical uh, properties. And having this, and there are developments uh, in that direction, um, having this information uh, at your fingertips together with the material tracking, um, this, this can help you. And maybe it's not the full solution, but it's, I think, a, a step in this direction, which I would expect. And we're working on that. Dieter, perfect. I think this is a very good step. Uh, only as an example, we tried uh, some time ago an instrument, a camera, in fact, in order to try to assess the granulometry of the raw material in an online way. Okay, so this would be, uh, for ex for instance, a very good tool if we could, if you could develop something on that to give real time raw material granulometry information, it's really important. Okay? Uh, obviously, today we have uh, moisture uh, measures, okay? but granulometry would be pretty, pretty good also. Uh, well, uh, we are over our time. I would love to be here more discussing with you, particularly myself, because I have had the opportunity of working with your three companies okay, throughout my career. So. It's a good, always a good debate, but we have uh, over time. Uh, so I would like to thank you all that made your questions, all of you that you were here, our speakers. It was a very, very good moment with interesting discussions and very important and updated. Okay, thank you a lot. Okay. Now mm -hmm. I will ask Mr. Aristides to make the final comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for everyone. It's difficult to add, to make additional comments. I think you, you make a very complete uh, comments in the end. So we actually are reaching the, the ABM target to promote technologies and innovation solutions. Uh, the specialists share with us their interesting experience about the how to face with the fluctuating hot metal demand and the so critical stop and go operation. Uh, we saw examples of routines, controls, planning ahead, monitoring and adjusting, some countermeasures, how to be prepared for unexpected high cost and eventual risks. And it was very interesting the discussion about how to control the beast. <laughs> The blast furnaces nowadays is more and more covered with uh, digitalized technology, thanks to development of the sensors, actuators, robotics, the know-how of data analytics, artificial intelligence, and statistical methods. But uh, the human factor is really something that cannot be substituted. And this is our in my opinion, a very important concern. The, the concern is to invest in training and continuous formation for new technicians. And for me, the, the most critical challenge is, is to create uh, attractiveness for the young people to work in this metallurgical sector. It's really a, cha a challenge for, for all of us. So, in name of ABM, sincere thanks to Rob, Philip, and Dieter for the high level presentation. Special thanks to Douglas for conducting the agenda and moderated the, the debates, who performed perfectly, even in, in, with a very short advice. Thanks to Elenu, together with me, coordinated this, this event, uh, and the ABM girls, Anna and Miriam giving total support in the backstage. We are proud to, to confirm that the audience reached our expectation. We, we have more than about 120 participants. We have other similar seminars in the beginning of the, the year, uh, still to be defined, but probably in the steel making area and in the rolling mill area, with the objective to present, to bring the newest technology apply it in these uh, sectors, always counting with the specialists of the main technological companies. We thank again all of you for your time. Uh, we remember, we like to, to ask the audience to not forget to answer the satisfaction survey. 
Take care, all of you. Even if it, in advance, I wish for all of you nice Christmas and happy new year. Goodbye and thank for all of you.